afternoon. So welcome to the webinar, Clean Energy for a Green Economy. As mentioned, I'm Carrie Pridmore with the Ministry of Community and Rural Development. The ministry is looking to deliver a web-based seminars on topics of interest and relevance to local government officials and other community leaders across BC. Our hope is that you'll find this webinar series to provide an additional link with new information and enable discussions between experts, media, industry, and government in an affordable and easily accessible manner. As Melissa already mentioned, this webinar will be recorded today and will be available on the Rural BC website where you can use it as a lasting resource. And following today's webinar, uh, we'll be seeking your feedback through a survey and also asking you about future topics of interest. So I'd like to introduce today's presenters. All of our presenters today are available online. Nobody's in here in the room here in Victoria. So first of all, uh, Dave, uh, sorry, Dale Littlejohn is the manager of strategy and outreach for the Community Energy Association. The first shop for local government leaders on climate and energy. For more than a decade, he's helped public and private sector organizations develop and implement energy strategies and efficiency, efficiencies, excuse me. He collaborates with local governments to identify opportunities for building a vibrant, connected future through responsible use of energy. Next, we have Kathy Lockman, the Business Development Officer for the Economic Development, Economic Development Couchin. Previously to locating to the Couchin region, she was the Economic Development Officer for seven years with Prince George. Kathy holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental and has been Chair of Links BC for four years. She's currently a member of EDABC and president of the Vancouver Island Coastal Economic Developers Association. In the rural green economic development, the Cowichan region is leading the way in applying a traditional economic development practices to developing a new clean tech sector in the region. The conference has been muted. Next, we're moving to David Johnson, who's the president of the Revelstoke Community Energy Corporation. He holds a PhD in chemistry from Simon, U sorry, Simon Fraser University and has worked in post-secondary education for 33 years, including nine years as academic dean and two years as executive advisor at Vanier College in Montreal. In the nonprofit sector, David has served in various executive capacities, including president of the Canadian Railroad Historical Association. Since retiring to Revelstoke, David and his wife own and operate the Minto Manor Bed and Breakfast in one of Revelstoke's finest heritage homes. He has served on the board of the Revelstoke Community Energy Association since shortly after his arrival in Revelstoke and assumed the presidency in June of 2006. I'm sorry you can't see David at this time. We're working on trying to get that video enabled, but you may just be able to hear him when the time comes. And lastly, uh, we have Diana Brooks, one of our staff with the Rural BC Secretariat. She's the regional manager for the Kootenai region. Her role involves facilitating, supporting, implementing economic and community economic development initiatives and projects in various communities, providing connections to provincial and federal government programs, services and initiatives, and building partnerships. She also works to identify and resolve local and regional issues, provide local and regional information to Victoria and liaise with other ministries and agencies, and leverage development sustainability and diversification opportunities. So thank you to all the presenters for joining us today. We're just going to move to our agenda for the session. And that includes uh, some presentations from the three speakers, uh, which will take approximately 40 minutes. We'll have at least 30 minutes for some questions and discussion, and then just five minutes for wrap up and closure. So I'd like to hand it over to Diana for the beginning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Am I live now? Yep, that's great, Diana. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to begin this webinar today and to be speaking to you on behalf of the Rural BC Secretariat. I would like to let you know about a soon-to-be-released Rural BC Secretariat tool, the introductory e-guidebook entitled Clean Energy for a Green Economy. <laughs> this webinar today, it's based on this tool. It's a project that was initiated by my colleague Chris Singh, Regional Manager for Vancouver Island North Coast and me, and it has been supported and funded by the Secretariat within the Ministry of Community and Rural Development. And it was also completed in collaboration with many of our colleagues and a lot of the other agencies and ministries that 
many of you have already worked with, such as Energy Mines, Petroleum Resources, Ministry of Environment, Climate Action Secretariat, Small Business, and the local government branch within our own ministry. All of these people are in the energy game, as we would say. And of course, our primary project partner on this initiative was Community Energy Association, whom you will hear speak after me today. Just a note to let you know that all participants who are on the webinar today will be notified when this e-guidebook becomes available. As regional managers, we work and we live in rural BC. We work with communities, organizations, all levels of government and businesses. We are essentially a link to government. And as Carrie indicated, we provide assistance, information, support, partnership, and strategic guidance. And our work focus has a very wide range. It's from community and economic development strategies to project implementation, infrastructure funding, sourcing that out, partnership building, regional alliances, and community transitions. So over the past year, interest and activity in the renewable and clean energy arena have increased, particularly in rural BC, in rural, with rural communities. And the reasons for this increase, they are varied. We can see at the provincial or the BC level that communities are working on their greenhouse gas reduction targets. There's the implementation of the BC Energy Plan, the Climate Action Plan. There are a host of initiatives that are happening province-wide. The province has set a very strong direction to achieve a low-carbon economy, and this has been an impetus. At the operational level, we're seeing communities undertaking conservancy and efficiency measures, and this may be just to assist their bottom line or for other reasons. There's also new technology that can substantially benefit local government operations. So these are some of the reasons that we're seeing for this interest in this activity. As we have been working on the ground with our clients, they have told us, and we have noticed this as well as those of us out in the field, that there is an abundance, almost an overabundance, of great information and option out there. And it's coming from a variety of sources, such as agencies, ministries, organizations, businesses. And all of this is designed to and assist communities and organizations and businesses with their projects and in their decision making. There is a downside, however. And that downside, sorry, I'm just going to change the slide here, becomes when you have to whether you have the time to be able to sort through all the different initiatives, plans, acts, charters, tools that are out there. And you almost need a PhD to be able to assimilate the complexity of some of these decisions that center around which technology to use, what governance model to, to select, how are you going to finance it, and how can we actually achieve more economic objectives and return. So I'm, I could give you time to sort of look at everything I put up on the slide here, but this just illustrates sort of local government and the community world. And if you can picture yourself being on the bottom of this, you're looking up at all of this coming at you. And this is what people are reading. This is what they're trying to follow or they're implementing. And these are where they're taking their targets and some of the targets that they're working on. And I would like to say, unfortunately, that this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a snapshot of what is out there. So the challenge becomes, how do you make an informed decision? And how do you realize the benefit to your community, to your local or regional economy? How do you realize benefits to your operation? It certainly is challenging. And we found that, and it particularly is even more challenging if you're a smaller community or you have limited staff and resources. So our goal for both the e-guidebook and today's webinar is to make it easier for you to access and navigate this information that is out there and to provide those direct links to detailed sources. For you to be able to understand your options, to provide you with some how-to examples, case studies, community peer examples, and we're pleased to be able to present several of those today. Inside, we're also looking at how, what is your implementation framework? How can you get ready and assess that you have the capabilities to be able to engage in this? And lastly, we'd like to begin the discussion on how you can transition and leverage, integrate your energy-related projects and actions into some long-term economic goals. So today, it is with pleasure that we'll be exploring some of the renewable and clean energy strategies, looking at some of these assessment and readiness tools and variables, and examining that green economy piece. So 
So at this time, it's my pleasure to be able to turn over the presentation to Dale Littlejohn with the Community Energy Association. Dale? Well, thank you very much, Diana, uh, for, that, uh, for, for that perspective on what's happening here. Uh, let, let me just take my hat off here first. Uh, the, these web effects are great sometimes. Um, but as you mentioned, we are with, I am with the Community Energy Association. We're a nonprofit society that has a mission to develop collaboratively, to develop capacity in local governments and collaboratively accelerate action on climate change. We have seven staff on Vancouver Island, well, the Lower Mainland, the Okanagan, and the Kootenays. We do a lot of research and education that's grant funded. However, we recognize that uh, you know, grants can dry up sometimes and things like that. So we are an enterprising nonprofit so that we aren't fully dependent on grant funding. So we don't just do the research, we actually help co communities implement uh, through consulting services as well. We have a number of members, which you, uh, which you can see on the screen, and a good number of these members are actively involved in the topic that I'm going to be talking about today, which is really around district energy systems and how you can generate some economic development from that. In the uh, center of the screen, we have the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, one of our recent members, who has some significant funding available not only for studies of district energy systems, but also for capital. City of North Van, of course, has had their district energy system running for quite a while now. Burns Lake, Prince George, and District of North Van are all in the process of uh, trying to identify district energy opportunities and implement them. Of course, Harrison and Corex uh, can help by owning the systems, uh, so you don't have to put up any capital up front. And BC Hydro has uh, significant grants available to uh, help co-fund studies. And of course, some of our supporters go along the bottom, including province of BC, uh, which also has some uh, grant programs that can be leveraged into uh, studies such as the infrastructure planning grant, which the village of Midway is using to uh, get us to do a district energy pre feasibility study for them. So it doesn't just have to be the large areas. This is a key theme going through this. Now, so, so why should we be interested in district energy and economic development and things of this nature? Well, I try to explain it with this slide. We're with communities, we're dealing with very long-lived capital assets. They, you know, street layouts generally don't change once we put them in. Buildings and infrastructure can last for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more. Uh, these assets are all going to be there as we go through the unavoidable surprises that we're going to see. If you're pessimistic about peak oil, it happened a couple of years ago. If you're optimistic, it's going to happen by 2030. If you're a local government, it doesn't matter whether you're optimistic or pessimistic because it's still within the lifespan of the capital asset. So we have a really significant rethinking about how we heat and cool and move around without fossil fuel. So that's going to be a significant reworking and restructuring, which will also require a lot of work to do. So there, there's, uh, there's a lot of activity starting to happen out there. There's leadership starting to happen with most communities having signed on to the Climate Action Charter. And of course, this past uh, Monday was the deadline to get GHG targets into official community plans. So the question now becomes how to meet those targets and use, use that action to help transition to a green economy. And that's really what, uh, what the guide is about that, uh, that Diana was mentioning, clean energy for a green economy. This guide started out as, uh, the, the concept started out as a fair, fairly small guide, but of course things do tend to evolve. So we, do, we are covering seven different uh, clean energy strategies in the guide. We have some extensive links to other information. In fact, eight pages of links at the back of the guide. One of the one of the innovative things that we did with this is for each of these strategies, we, we created a four-page council-ready summary that simply uh, goes through what the technology is, how to identify opportunities, uh, and how to identify economic development opportunities. And I'm going to go through that in a little bit uh, more detail. 
Of course, it's not just about clean energy. It's also about conservation, and we'll get into that a little bit later as well. So when we talk about district energy, well, what is it? Simply put, it is heating and or cooling more than one building. So sharing the heating and cooling systems between a couple of buildings, ideally through renewable energy technology. And there's some, some specific technical things that you can do with district energy systems to help enable uh, a variety of renewable energy technologies. Things like you know, building it on a hot water system rather than a steam system uh, so that you have a, a greater variety of technologies that you can use to generate that heat without necessarily combusting um, something, whether that's biomass or natural gas. Now, one of the, uh, one of the interesting things that, uh, that we're seeing is the very, very significant amount of interest all across BC from one end to the other in district energy systems. Uh, we see a good number of systems uh, starting to emerge in some of the larger, uh, larger centers, such as Vancouver and, uh, and Kelowna and others. Uh, but we also see a great number of systems either under investigation or in the process of being implemented. Now, we, you do need a, a certain amount of heat load to, uh, to make a district energy system viable. However, even in some of the smaller centers, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, possible. So just because you're, uh, if you're in a small community, it's not just because you're, don't, don't be worried if you're small. There may still be some significant opportunities there. So if we want to pursue these opportunities, well, how, how do we go about doing that uh, from a practical perspective? Well, we kind of see four phases. There's some planning, figuring out whether it makes sense to, uh, whether there is an opportunity there or not, designing uh, the system, building and installing it, and then the ongoing operations. And of course, we, uh, we do deal with local governments a lot, so uh, we know that one of the first questions that comes up is, well, where, where do we find the funding to actually do these things? And you're looking for different types of money in the different stages. The good news is that there's a good variety of grants across all these stages to, uh, to help you, particularly in the, uh, in the upfront stages. And BC Hydro in particular is, uh, has, is just launching a program to co-fund district energy studies, Federation of Canadian Municipalities for the larger uh, uh, studies. There's a, a great variety of, uh, of other ones as well. And these are all detailed in our funding guide, which uh, a new version of is coming out over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned on our website uh, for that, for a detailed list of all the uh, funding opportunities here. Now, thinking a little bit more about the planning component, well, one of the, first, one of the things that we've done in this guide, in those four-page summaries of energy strategies, is we go through a number of questions designed to get that initial first blush as to, well, is, is this something that's worth further investigation? So thinking through, are, are there low-cost sources of heat that have some long-term availability? Uh, long-term availability is, uh, is, is interesting, particularly when you're starting to think through the finances, the longer-term finances of the program. Uh, just because there is biomass available today uh, doesn't necessarily mean that next year or five years from now you're, you're going to have access to that same biomass unless you have uh, some agreements in place. Uh, similarly, if you have some uh, some opportunities with a large industrial that has a large industrial operation that has waste heat that's close to uh, other buildings, well, there that could be a great opportunity there. There's also huge potential to collaborate across the public sector. Uh, remembering, of course, that the pro provincial government, all schools, hospitals, towns, colleges, and universities all have a commitment to being carbon neutral in their operations. And all these organizations have buildings across all of BC that can be used as uh, potentially a nice anchor for these systems as they start to grow out into the community. 
So, so this is a summary of some of the questions that we've got in the district energy uh, piece in the guide. Now, if we want to delve a little bit deeper and get into um, you know, developing a report that could be presented to council to uh, to help them make the decision around should, should we invest a significant amount of money to get through a detailed uh, design or feasibility study. The, well, the process that we've gone through with a number of local governments, including governments such as San Triple Langley or Kelowna or uh, the one that we're going through now with Midway, is we start by looking at the demand. So wait, where is the heat? heat requirement across the community. Are there pockets where you've got some dense, uh, stable loads of, of heat demand? And what are the specific location-specific renewable heat sources? And this really does get location-specific. Then go through what, what are the techno specific technologies, the financial implications, and what kind of supporting policies are required? Do you need a development permit area, service area, or, uh, or other options uh, in there to ensure connection. And we also look through the utility options, um, the structure of utilities and the governance. Do you, does the local government own it? Do, uh, do you get Harrison or Corrick to, uh, or some, someone else to come in and own and operate it? Uh, and then developing an integrated plan exists. So that's going to kind of towards the next step in terms of level of detail of answering those questions around does it make sense here. And, and that's kind of the, the green energy or the clean energy side. Looking at the green economy opportunities across this, uh, we, we see opportunities in each of the phases of project development. In the planning and designing and, uh, and even across some of the other uh, phases, working with uh, the local colleges to help develop uh, uh, expertise in designing these systems or building skill sets, also collaborating with science and technology councils across BC. And there, there's a good number of workforce development opportunities across these, uh, uh, these different phases, as well as going beyond workforce opportunities in, into things like enhanced community profile and branding if the community wants to uh, attract some of the, uh, some of the green, uh, green economy companies. And again, this is what, what this guide is designed to do, is provide a practical how-to on a lot of this, because we're seeing a lot of the major centers, uh, communities like the city of Toronto, Chicago, Vancouver, and Surrey, doing really great things on green economic development strategy. But this guide is intended more for the communities who may not have quite the same level of resources as the big players. Now, one of the specific opportunities with the district energy system is the potential to recirculate some money within the community. Uh, just taking a look at a number of different communities, looking at community-wide gas consumption, from the community energy and emissions inventories that the province of BC has put together and recently uh, released updated versions of, um, we, we can see how much natural gas is being used across a number of communities. And through taking a, a very high level uh, estimate of $10 a gigajoule, we can see the total amount that's being spent in these communities. So even in a community of you know, 5,000 people, you could equally see $800,000 of energy spending. Uh, now, would, would recirculating some of that in the local economy make a difference in terms of economic development? Well, possibly. Uh, we, we think there's great opportunity to start to build, uh, build and strengthen local economies through taking climate action. Now, again, I said that I mentioned that there were opportunities at all stages, both on the clean energy strategy, but also uh, on the bottom of this slide, more, with, uh, more on the conservation opportunities. Uh, this is uh, the bottom of the slide here is where we're looking at uh, building energy efficiency retrofits and things of that nature. So similar but slightly different stages and similar but slightly different opportunities. And again, there's huge opportunity for significant workforce development and job opportunities 
when you think of the number of buildings uh, in your community that could benefit uh, from energy efficiency retrofits now, uh, there, there's a number of tools that local governments can use to encourage those retrofits, but there's also potentially yeah, roles for other, uh, other levels of government in, uh, in this as well. So getting into beyond, again, the simple workforce development opportunities, you could potentially use these projects to stimulate the green market or support, support the growth of existing uh, green businesses that are potentially involved in the design or implementation of some of these technologies. Uh, and getting the word out that your community is a green one and could attract other uh, companies and businesses that want to be uh, uh, involved with that sector. So again, we have a detailed how-to section on community economic development related to clean energy in this guide. And it, really, and it starts to go beyond a project. So how do you use a project to start to develop a sector or, uh, or an economy overall? And so uh, that, that's a brief introduction to the guide and some of the thinking behind it. Uh, it will be uh, released hopefully in the, uh, in the near future. And I look forward to uh, answering some questions after this. And with that, I will uh, introduce Kathy to talk about all the cool stuff that's happening in uh, Calgon. And uh, over to you, Kathy. Great. Thanks, Dale. Um, I'm going to give a, a brief example of uh, some of the initiatives that we're doing around clean technology. And I'll just give you a little bit of background. Uh, we're located in the Cowichan region on Vancouver Island between Nanaimo and Victoria. Economic Development Cowichan is an in-house economic development arm of the uh, Cowichan Valley Regional District. We are mostly funded by the CVRD. We are a fairly small office. We have three people that work in economic development, and we serve as a population of about 80,000 people over a very large geographic area. We're made up of small communities. Um, in terms of our governance structure, we have four municipalities and nine electoral areas, so we have a fairly complex um, local government. Traditionally, we have been a forestry and resource-based economy and uh, we are seeing that transitioning into more of a retail and service-based economy. Our main sectors that um, are our, our growth sectors are agriculture and tourism. And back in 2008, we identified clean technology as an emerging sector that we could uh, use to diversify our economy. So this is an overview of some of the things that I'm going to be talking about and the process that we used to roll out our clean technology strategy. And I'll talk a bit about the research that we did, um, some of the setting the stage, putting in the groundwork, creating demand, creating supply, forming the partnerships that we needed, some of the challenges that uh, we are running into. I'll use a real life example of a couple of companies that we're working with, as well as um, some of the next steps. This is just for the beginning of a process for us. Okay. So in terms of the research, we commissioned two reports, uh, Clean Technology Reports 1 and 2. They were 50% funded by Invest Canada Community Initiatives. The first report identified the clean technology sector in our region. We really had no idea what businesses we had who were working on clean technology. And we identified through the report 14 companies that were actively working on clean technology initiatives. Everything from wastewater treatment to advanced building components to renewable energy. Um, the second report focused on energy. And we uh, looked at specifically taking the existing resources that we have in our region and exploring some of the business opportunities that may be attached to that. The report also identified that we have few local markets in our region for renewable energy products. So we knew we had to create the demand side as well as the supply side in the work that we were going to do. So ultimately, we are focusing on uh, waste to energy, solar, waste wood, wind as potential energy sources, 
And we're also looking at biogas because we do have a fairly vibrant agriculture um, industry. We also put together a Clean Technology Advisory Committee made up of representatives from Community Futures, the Environment Commission, interested stakeholders in the community who had an interest in looking at clean technology. So to provide some of the framework, we used our existing business retention and expansion program called Cowichan First to identify companies uh, in the region to talk to about some of the challenges they're having, some of the um, energy uses that they're currently using, and how they could uh, switch over their systems to renewable energy systems. We also um, are working very closely with the CVRD in terms of their regional energy plan that they are creating. And we're working with the political and regulatory environment to ensure that there are no barriers to, um, to having clean energy and clean technologies in our region. We're encouraging local governments to look at local solutions to local problems. We feel that that's a, a sustainable model for us. And education, we, we just can't be learning enough right now about what's going on. Uh, Diana showed the slide earlier of all the little bubbles of, of um, what's going on, and it's, uh, it, it's a challenge to keep up with, with uh, what's happening. Um, but we're constantly trying to learn about what's the newest, the best, and what, um, um, what programs we could uh, encourage in our region. Um, funding for, for our program, uh, other than the ICCI dollars that we receive for the studies, we have a very small budget for, uh, for clean technology. It is part of our core budget, so we're making do with what, um, what resources we can bring to the table. So in terms of creating demand, we are working with, as I mentioned, our existing businesses to convert their existing energy needs to renewable energies. We're also working with the political and institutional organizations to incorporate clean energy into new and existing public buildings. Um, this includes waste to energy, which is a, a big one right now, and we see it as a, as a wonderful opportunity. Uh, waste is becoming a commodity, so our position is to capture that commodity rather than exporting it elsewhere. Uh, new developments, we have some fairly substantial new residential developments um, um, on, the, on the books to, uh, to come into the Cowichan, and, and uh, there, there is talk to require alternative energy systems incorporated into those developments. We haven't done that, but it's certainly something that's under discussion. And local organizations, we've identified a number of localized local organizations in our region that are also working on the demand side. They're creating awareness. They're going out and they're talking to people. They're talking about solar. They're talking about all different types of things that the general public can do that will help r raise demand for renewable energy products and includes the CVRD Environment Commission, the Couch and Carbon Busters, ca um, Couch and Energy Alternatives. So we need to make sure that we're plugged into uh, what they're doing. So creating supply, we are encouraging the use of solar, biomass, wind in, in new developments. We're also identifying existing resources and developing opportunities and business cases so that, um, so that we can raise the, the supply of renewable energies in our region. And an example of that is, is wood waste. Um, we've identified uh, a significant opportunity in terms of, of taking that wood waste and creating a renewable energy product out of that. We are marketing that opportunity to new investors, and um, we're, we're getting out there in the marketplace and saying, here's the opportunity. We've created the regulatory environment for a new um, industry to come in and, um, and develop some new um, um, energy technologies. We're also marketing our existing businesses and existing technologies to a wider audience, to, and we're assisting those companies in attending key trade shows so that they can expand their markets. Now, we can't do this alone, and we understand that it's very important to create those partnerships and link in wherever we can, and um, uh, looking at all levels of government, 
looking at the BC Bioenergy Network, Solar BC, looking at areas where we can link in. Uh, Links BC, which is the EDABC Economic Development Association of British Columbia's investment attraction arm, we're linking into their clean technology initiative as well. So some of the challenges uh, that um, we have faced and we are in, in many ways still facing, uh, there certainly is a reluctance at the local level to use um, local technologies and resources. A lot of these technologies are new and local governments do tend to be risk averse. And uh, so, so getting some of our local technologies into uh, local government um, systems has been challenging. Um, electricity costs are sometimes prohibitive to renewables with, um, with the current um, with the current prices that BC Hydro will pay for renewable energies. Uh, retrofits of existing businesses to, to, um, to retrofit them into a renewable energy source can be very um, costly. And um, as I said, many of the uh, technologies are new and unproven. It takes a lot of time to wade through a lot of these uh, technologies and, and figure out what's going to be the best one for, for your community. So an example, um, as I mentioned before, we have to grow, kind of grow the demand side and the supply side at the same time. So we are working with uh, some greenhouse operators in our region who are currently burning uh, natural gas or propane to heat their greenhouses. And we've approached them to say, hey, um, you know, is there, um, is there a way we can look at using renewables as a, as a heat source for your operations? At the same time, we have an existing um, wood operation who has a fair amount of waste fiber who's saying, gee, I'd really like to uh, develop this waste fiber and do something useful. So we're matching the greenhouse operator to the uh, waste fiber folks and saying, okay, let's, let's develop a, a pellet or a puck or some other energy product from that wood waste that then could be fed into the greenhouse operation. So next steps, as I mentioned, we're just at the beginning of, of figuring out what we're doing, but we do know that we will be developing a green economic development strategy, uh, incorporating, here's the new buzzword, triple bottom line into uh, the activities that Economic Development Couch and will be doing, the economic, social, and environment. And so we will be looking at uh, existing strategies, transforming into new strategies, industry attraction, looking at local quality of life, uh, industry expansion, looking at industry efficiency, how can we make our existing companies more efficient. Uh, building infrastructure, uh, looking at that and saying how can we do reduce waste, recycle. Workforce attraction into workforce development. We need to ensure that our existing workforce is employed and is uh, providing the skills into the, the new clean energy marketplace. Resource extraction, we would like to as a new strategy, go into eco-restoration and renewable energy. And the last one, land inventory, um, transitioning into urban form and some green building um, operations. So that is the end of my presentation, and I would like to turn it over to David Johnson this time. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Johnson, President of the Revelstoke Community Energy Corporation. I Dale has given us an excellent overview of the step-by-step -step process which you can go through to actually develop, look at uh, feasibility, and then develop some uh, good opportunities. I think Kathy has taken us through the step-by-step -step process that College and Valley has actually been through and what they're looking to do in the near future. And I get the privilege of taking you through an actual operation. The Revelstoke uh, I'm just trying to get my slide to advance here. I'm doing it. There, okay. Hi, I can change it for you if you like. Okay. Next slide. Uh, the Revelstoke Community Energy Project is a heat only project. It consists of a 1.5 megawatt biomass boiler and a backup of 1.75 megawatt propane. It, uses the wood waste from the Downey Mill. Interestingly enough, 
the waste is in quotes there for a very important reason. At the time RCEC was established, the waste was in tru truly a waste product. There was no market for it, so we, we were an opportunity for them to dispose of some of their waste product. They now, of course, can sell cedar bark down into the states for commercial ground cover and various other things. So in fact, the, the waste is no longer waste, but it's just one of the supply, uh, one of the products they produce and one of the supply side items that we have to worry about. What our biomass boiler does is it actually heats hot oil. The hot oil passes through a steam generator, which produces steam for sale to the Downey uh, dry kilns. And then it also produces hot water through heat exchangers and through a 2.3 kilometer uh, piping system, we heat the major buildings in the core of the city of Revelstoke. And next slide. The plant building is on a uh, quarter acre land donated by Downey Mills. And the fuel bin is at the back of it. And it's very convenient being located literally on the mill site because the mill actually delivers the fuel to us by front end loader and dumps it in the fuel bin, which is equipped with a walking floor and moves it forward into the screws that feed the combustor. Next slide, please. Inside the plant, you'll see on the left-hand picture, on the left-hand side of the picture, the KMW uh, biomass boiler. Uh, it's nice and clean in that picture. It's fairly early on in its existence. Next to it, behind the second black column, is the steam generator tube bundle. And so this, the hot oil comes down, uh, one of the silver pipes there passes into it and passes out through the other, and then passes on to the hot water heat exchangers to generate the hot water. And behind all of that, the red and the blue is the propane backup boiler. The pipeline then is shown on the right-hand side. The pipes are insulated and they contain a leak detection system, an electrical system that will pinpoint fairly accurately if there is ever a leak in the system as to exactly where that leak is. Next slide, please. Why we undertook this project in Revelstoke back, uh, they actually started looking at it in as early as 1999, and the plant finally came online in 2005, is the Downey Mill was using a silo burner to burn its waste product. It was polluting the air, and Revelstoke is in a very narrow valley, so the air quality was suffering from that. So we helped both Downey Mills eliminate their silo burner, and we improved the air quality at the same time. And we also have eliminated about 3,400 tons per year of greenhouse gas that has been either from the, the burners, the silo burners, or from the propane that we've displaced. It provides an alternate energy source for city and private buildings, and it actually provides a non-taxable, non-tax source of city revenue. Incremental plant expansion actually is an opportunity, and we've been in existence five, year net, five years now, and we're at the point of looking at how we should go about the expansion or the next phase of the energy corporation project. So we're taking this waste wood product, we're adding value to it, we're uh, gathering revenue from both the heat and from the steam produced, and it is keeping the money in Revelstoke as opposed to shipping it out. And so next slide, please. We provide a number of advantages as do most district energy systems. One is the long-term stable energy pricing to our customers. We entered into energy supply agreements with our customers where we guarantee that their price of energy will increase by only the rate of increase in the cost of living index in BC for the next 20 years. And in addition to that, our customers no longer have need for a boiler, a boiler room, or maintenance of the boiler room and boiler, and it saves space and actually saves some cost, and it provides a win-win solution, of course, to the waste wood product uh, problem here in Revelstoke. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, this is a heat-only project. We initially looked at doing a combined heat and power uh, system, but it was simply too expensive for a community the size of Revelstoke to undertake from scratch. So the heat-only project cost $7 million 
in total. We spent three million on the plant and equipment associated with that central plant. We spent two million dollars on the community energy system and about 1.1 million for the actual energy transfer stations in the various buildings that came online. Uh, that brings us me to another advantage to our system in that we actually cover the capital costs for buildings to actually come online with district energy. That means there is no upfront capital cost that is then calculated into their energy rates down the, over the next 20 years. And finally, there was development costs and construction prices, et cetera, before we actually started producing steam. Where did it all come from? Well, we're extremely fortunate in Revelstoke for a number of reasons. One, we have a community forest corporation. They're managed by a holding company, and they advanced a loan of $1.25 million to the Energy Corporation at no, no interest. The city uh, invested $1.2 million of uh, capital preferred shares in the purchase in which they're getting 7% interest on. Uh, FCM, the Green Funds, loaned us $1.35 million at 3.5% roughly. And the credit union loaned us $1 million. That was the only money we had to borrow on the open market. And the Green Funds also extended their grant of $1.81 million to the project. Finally, from BC, we were able to add a $3.5 million Towns for Tomorrow grant to it to give us the necessary funds to actually achieve the project. Next slide, please. We, as it is stands now, the simple payback for the investment is about 13 years. Originally, it was estimated that it would take 10 years to pay back the investment. Our return on investment has dropped from what was originally forecast to 5.3%, and the return on equity is now at 8.8%, down from 13.8%. Uh, there are a number of reasons, and we'll get into some of those later on, why we didn't achieve our, our target, targets there. Next slide, please. Our experience in actually doing this project is that we came in about 2% over budget, and this is quite good considering that we're building at the height of the construction boom period. So we were quite good at keeping costs under control up to the time of commissioning. We then ran into a number of operating problems, which of course weren't budgeted for. They never are, and this is part of the problem of new startups anyway. We ended up with water in the thermal oil, which does the oil and water doesn't mix, so that led to problems. We had heat exchanger failures. They simply weren't robust enough and we actually had to change out several of the heat exchangers before we could proceed. We had a, a fairly steep learning curve on the boiler operation. The fuel feed had to be modified for the kind of, of stock we were getting. We can burn either chips, sawdust, or hog fuel if it's properly chopped up, but each require a different adjustment on the boiler and it's in the oxygen flow and the rate of feed. We failed, did not meet the first two years' revenue projections, and this was largely because we didn't build out the entire system in the first two years. The funding and the customers just weren't ready to undertake it at that time. We are now fully built out for the first phase of the expansion. And all of the above problems basically cost us money to fit, so, so we came in uh, not producing the revenue that we expected in the first three or four years of the project. Next slide, please. Other problems we encountered, the steam generator and, combust and combustion pipe in the burner itself corroded this pipe having proper water treatment, and we had to replace the uh, pipe in the combustor, and that was partially because of a leak caused by inferior refractory, and that happened in year four. It shouldn't have happened until about year 10. Uh, there was a small fire in the hydraulics room in December of last year, which took the combustor offline, but with the propane backup, we were able to continue to supply continuously the district energy heating system. Uh, part of our problem with building out the entire system was that there is a distinct lack of awareness in this, of district energy in certain key federal and provincial government departments give you an example, just one example of this. Our federal building in town 
it took probably seven years from the initial contact and three years from the time that the federal government said they were going green to actually get the federal government to sign on to district energy. It just is a very lengthy, tedious process, even though the politicians are saying we're going to be green. Uh, we had to go with the salt oil loop system because if we'd gone to a straight steam generation system, at the size that we were looking at, we would have had to have 24-7 staffing of the plant. And the small plant just simply cannot afford that. So we used the hot oil loop to get around that particular problem. Next slide, please. I won't go through all of these. Uh, some things, when you're talking to people, they have difficulty understanding what is the seasonal boiler efficiency. You put a boiler on, run it at uh, constant load, it works very, very well and the uh, manufacturers will tell you they work at 92 to 95 percent efficient. When they actually get in use and you're cycling, cycling them on and off, up and down in terms of temperature, you're actually using heat to actually heat up the system each time. So the actual heat output from the system drops, so your boiler efficiency drops. Most customers uh, won't admit that that actually happens. And uh, so we have to be careful on how you approach customers Make sure they understand that sort of thing so that you can get them to actually sign into and buy into district energy systems. Uh, I won't do anything else on that. Next slide, please. What about the future? Well, we're extremely fortunate with RCEC. We have a very good corporate citizen in Downey. They entered into a 20-year fuel supply agreement with the Energy Corporation, and that will run out in 15 years' time we have to be able to cover the cost of actually buying feedstock at that point in time. Or what happens if, in fact, the mill closes? And they continued operating throughout the recent downturn, but there's no guarantee to be there forever. Uh, if we move on to expand the plant or the system and or the system, it's going to cost money. We're going to probably be boring that in commercial markets or pursuing other grants for a plant that already exists and that may be more difficult than doing borrowing for a startup. And uh, as things warm up in Revelstoke, the new schools coming online, for instance, over the next couple of years, are looking for cooling. Should RCEC be looking at adding cooling capacity to its district energy system? That's something that some places might be very interested in uh, looking at when they get actually at the design phase. And then, of course, there is the question of what is the minimum size of project to get good e economies of scale. Uh, I won't speculate on that at the present time. I would say ours is at the minimum effective size. Other challenges, it's expensive to hook up, hook up individual residences. If you have a heat exchanger in each building, you have the piping into it, you have the heat exchanger, be it a, a heat exchanger in a plenum of a forced air furnace or a, a heat exchanger in a uh, hot water heating system. They're both problems. Uh, again, I won't go through everything. In Revelstoke, the major competition for green energy has been ground source heat pumps. Uh, engineers know and understand them to a certain extent. They recognize that they were within the lead standard system. District energy was added to the lead standards as an addendum, and a number of engineers have difficulty making the transition to understanding how district energy can, in fact, uh, improve the lead standards for new buildings. So that's a con current concern for us. And next. Next, please. And why, why were we successful? Well, as the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. We were extremely fortunate to have a council who has been extremely committed to improving the community here in Revelstoke. They have gone through a, the establishment of the Revelstoke Community Forest Corporation, saw that that was a, a great job generator. They knew the mills were in trouble and they needed a way to get rid of their uh, waste wood, and so the Energy Corporation was part of that solution. The interest of council continues. In fact, we're uh, just engaged the consultants and are about to launch 
the Community Energy and Emissions Plan here for Revelstoke. And under that plan, the Energy Corporation is playing a major role, and we hope to be able to base our strategic plan for the next five years on what comes up under the CEEP. We were extremely fortunate that the green funds were coming online with their grants and uh, financing programs, and other programs were coming online as we were looking for money to actually do this. The community was behind the project. They wanted the air improvement, they wanted the climate improvement to actually occur, and they were willing to do it. However, none of this would have happened if we didn't have Dr. Jeff Battersby, who was the project and is still very much the project champion. He was the fellow who jumped in there and actually worked with council to get them to understand the advantages of community energy, worked with the individual uh, companies and, and in, uh, buildings that joined up to the district energy system, and worked very closely with the Downey Mills project. And then we were lucky to have uh, good consultants in FBB and good staff, and we were just lucky that this all came together at the same time. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned before, we're extremely fortunate to have a good corporate citizen in Downey uh, Timber. They gave the plant site to the Energy Corporation. They provided a 20-year fuel supply agreement delivered to the fuel bin for free because they saw it as a way of getting rid of waste product from the beginning. And they have struck up to that commitment and are seeing, are seeing that through. They also signed a 20-year contract to purchase steam energy from the plant. So we have a, a client who is willing to take about 50% of our heat product right there across the street in the kilns at the Downey Mills. And they were willing to work with us and provide the kiln operator on a 50-50 share to actually operate the plant. And so we got an excellent plant operator out of them as well. So everything fell into place very, very nicely. Okay. Would we do it again? Yes, we've had our headaches, uh, we've had our challenges. Uh, it's always a challenge to keep a, a plant running in a small community, but I think we would do it again and be very pleased to do that. So that's a nutshell preview of Revelstoke Community Energy. I'd be happy to answer specific questions either now or later. So thank you very much. Turn it back over to Melissa. Great. Uh, thank you to all of the presenters. Those were very informative uh, presentations. Um, we have a couple discussion questions to perhaps get you started. Of course, um, you may have developed some questions on your own. So just to remind some of the um, remind you and inform some of the latecomers to this webinar that for this discussion, if you look to the right-hand corner and see a green square, if you turn that to purple, we'll see that you have a question and we'll address you by name and then you can pose your question. I'm going to try unmuting all of the lines right now so you don't have to each be hassled with unmuting your lines, but if we experience some feedback, I'll have to uh, re-mute. We'll just try that. The conference has been unmuted. Thanks. 
Um, uh, David, thanks for the presentation and uh, congratulations to Rebel Stoke once again for uh, your leadership there. Um, have you uh, calculated uh, what uh, the economics of the system would be if you had to pay for your fuel? Yeah, we have. Uh, we would probably have gone with higher energy rates uh, from the beginning, and that creates uh, a problem. We did guarantee the rates would all be 5% less than the pipe propane which we were displacing, and so it would have mm -hmm. cut down that margin. The way it works now is that we have this first period of time where we are actually paying off the loans, and then we will be in a position to have fuel. So it's sort of phasing in the financial expenses, operational side of things that way. So it works quite well for us to do it this way. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from any of the other attendees? Star, did you have a question? Uh, let's actually take Sheldon in the room. So Ted's going to pose a question to David. Thank you. Great. Hi, Melissa. Yeah, Ted Sheldon, Climate Action Secretary here. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Diana, Kathy, Dale, David. Uh, awesome presentations. Very, very much appreciated. Uh, question to Kathy, if I can. Kathy, you mentioned the uh, Clean Tech Advisory Committee. Just uh, to what extent do you envision them playing, influencing, and providing advice to the uh, Coucher Valley Regional Energy Plan? Uh, we, we see that as a very high priority for the committee. We see them playing a very uh, strategic and a political role uh, within our community as well as raising awareness about the importance of the uh, work that we're doing. So, yes, they're going to play a very important role. So they're an advisory committee, amongst other things, to the to the regional energy plan itself. Uh, they they haven't been um, yet, but the, the uh, regional energy plan is in a very early stage. But there will be opportunity for consultation, and um, and the group will be part of that consultation process. Thanks very much. You're welcome. While we're waiting for other questions to be generated, I just wanted to highlight that um, we do have the resources that um, Dale alluded to here with, of course, the one guide pending and um, the contact information for the presenters on the last slide. So feel free to change your feedback to purple if you had any questions or wanted to respond to the discussion questions posed here. Do you have another question, Pat? I do. Thanks, Melissa. And uh, this one's to uh, Kathy and, and Kathy. Uh, congratulations to Cowichan on your uh, leadership in this uh, uh, clean energy uh, sector. Can you talk a bit more about um, uh, local government, uh, the, the, the challenge uh, at with, with the local governments uh, being risk averse and how you um, have been overcoming that? Is it um, is it simply a matter of education, and if so, how are you doing that? How are you approaching that, or are there other aspects to it? Uh, th thanks, Pat, for your question, and um, um, I, I don't know that it is an issue that we have, have yet overcome. I, I think it, it, uh, it is typical of, of local governments uh, that they are risk averse and that they um, they want to explore every option before moving ahead with a strategy. And um, I think the comment is, relates very much to the waste to energy uh, initiative uh, in terms of, of the technologies that are out there and what's going to be the best solution 
for the Cowichan region in terms of dealing with it, with their waste. And so it's, um, I, I don't know that I have a really good answer for that. I think it's, it's a challenge to get local governments to, to step outside the box um, in, in terms of embracing some of these new technologies. We are encouraging the, uh, the uh, politicians to look at especially local solutions and local technology. Uh, what tends to happen is we have some very innovative companies in our region who end up exporting their, uh, their technology to other regions and other places in the world who are embracing the technology, but, but we're not embracing it here. So I think it's an ongoing education. I think you're right, we need to educate our politicians and, and point out that, uh, that to be truly sustainable, we need to, to look at local solutions for some of our local issues. Sure do, but yeah. that's good. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna mute all the lines again. There's just some distracting background noise. The conference has been muted. Uh, so just to remind you to respond both to the presenters and the attendees, you need to press star 7 to meet, unmute your individual line. So, Kathy, if you weren't quite finished, sorry, uh, just press star 7. Uh, yes, I think I was. Okay. Did, Pat, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks, Kathy. So we have these excellent presenters online for another 20 minutes, if you have questions. David Mills has one. Oh, remember you have to press star 7, David, to pose your question. I'm unmuted uh, now? Yes, great. Uh, perfect. Okay, so I actually had a quick question for Dale. Um, uh, Dale, you mentioned briefly that uh, you've been uh, working with the Village of Midway to uh, uh, develop some sort of energy plan, and I was just wondering uh, what type of if you've run into any problems with scale in that community and how you'd be dealing with those. Hi. Uh, yes, we've uh, been, we, we're working with the Village of Midway looking at district energy opportunities and heat sharing opportunities. And one of the really interesting things about this is that even in a small center, uh, Mid Midway is not a large community uh, along Highway 3 there, there, there does look like there's some really strong opportunities to share heat in at least two or three buildings uh, there, and quite possibly a few others. And they have a, uh, a fairly small downtown kind of area. There's an arena, a uh, community center, and a few other buildings. There's a, uh, there's a seniors facility there. Uh, I think a couple of other uh, public sector buildings all located within about a block or two of each other. So it looks like we could uh, we could find some opportunities uh, there. We're looking right now, uh, the strongest opportunities are looking like waste heat opportunities from the, uh, the ice rink that they've got. But there's also a strong potential for uh, geo-exchange. We're looking at the soil conditions uh, right now and the drilling records to see if that, uh, if that might be valuable there. Beyond that, uh, we're also going to take a quick look at the building scale opportunities. Because even if there's not an opportunity uh, for large scale district energy systems, and it's probably not going to be quite as big as a, a, a Revelstoke district energy system, there would still all, there's always opportunities, uh, at least in all the communities that we've looked at so far, for building scale opportunities. So think of things like solar hot water. Solar BC program is currently going on where you, local governments can get up to 50% uh, uh, funding from uh, the, the various solar BC grants for solar hot water systems on their own buildings. But that, uh, that's an opportunity for individual residences. We see in the Okanagan entire new single detached subdivisions going in with individual geo exchange systems. And that's being done at a cost uh, that really isn't uh, significantly more to the uh, to the purchaser. So there, there's a number of uh, opportunities there, and there's opportunities that we've seen in communities at all scale. So does, does that answer your question? 
That's all right. I'm muted for a second. Yeah, thanks, Dale. That's great. Did you have a question? Uh, star seven to unmute your line. Hello. There you are. Hi. Thank you. I do have a question um, for Dale, and it's about what he just mentioned about um, some of the single-family subdivisions that are being created. I think it was in the interior. I can't remember now where exactly it was, but have you seen any of those type of subdivisions on individual geo exchange and the heat pumps? that are operated by local governments, or is it all with um, a different utility company? Oh, thank you, Rochelle, for that, that question. Yeah, there's a, a number of subdivisions going in in the Okanagan uh, in a couple different communities. Of course, uh, uh, Sun Rivers uh, is, uh, is one that, uh, that did that. There's also some, some subdivisions going in in uh, Kelowna and I believe uh, a couple other uh, communities out there. You've seen most of them being owned by a uh, Apple asset company like Geotility or uh, or others like that. I know Corex has been involved in a few of those. Uh, there's nothing to prevent a local government from uh, becoming involved in that and setting up a, a distributed energy utility. We're uh, seen a lot of local governments owning their own district energy utilities. Um, there's some advantages and, uh, and disadvantages there. Uh, there's the ability to uh, at rates at what the local government wants to in order to uh, create the right, uh, right signals, whether that's getting more people onto the system or encouraging conservation. Uh, when the local government is running an energy utility, it'll have to go through uh, the BC Utilities Commission, whereas uh, when a private sector uh, company is, uh, is running it, you do have to go through there. Uh, now, having said that, it also provides some exposure for the local government when they're setting energy prices as well. Some local governments are more comfortable with that than, uh, than others. but. Uh, I, I haven't seen it specifically owned by local governments, but there's no reason why one couldn't. Oh, thank you. Do you um, I'm just going to jump back in. It's Rochelle Morrow. Do you see any, um, what, what might be the uh, problem with setting energy prices? I didn't quite understand what you meant there. Well, one of the uh, one of the concerns uh, that I've seen from a number of, or from a from at least one or two local governments is that if you own the uh, the energy utility and council is approving uh, prices for energy for a portion of their uh, population and prices are going up, for instance, uh, to meet the uh, capital requirements and operational requirements of the utility, that, that could provide for a little bit of a political exposure for, uh, for council. But I think there's, uh, there's, there's often ways uh, to manage that, but it is a concern that comes up. Uh, is, uh, is that something that's uh, being considered in, uh, in your community? or? Uh? Um. Hi. Uh, well, yeah, we're we're doing our regional energy plan right now, and one of the we have a couple people who in our area on the political side and within the local government who are very keen to um, move forward on something like this, either a district energy or the distributed energy, and we're just kind of wading our way through it right now and figuring out what might be a good project to look more closely at. Yeah, I mean, one potential advantage if. Uh, the, uh, the local government, be it a municipality or uh, district, uh, wants to uh, wants to get into that game, is that they, they could potentially establish a distributed energy utility that could potentially look at owning the physical assets for a variety of technologies. 
So not necessarily just geo exchange, but also potentially solar hot water or uh, or other types of systems, charging the users uh, back uh, for the uh, for the energy that they get from that. So it'd be a way to create change across a across a couple of different uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, we'll just give you a few more minutes, see if there are any other questions out there. So I think uh, we're hearing that probably there are no more questions at this time. So I'd just like to jump in and thank the presenters for joining us today and all the participants that have been on the line. Very much appreciate uh, your participation. Just want to remind you that we will be following up with a survey after the webinar and we look forward to your feedback that you'll provide and any suggestions. And a reminder that in the top right hand corner where there's the three note sheets, there is a copy of the presentation for you to download if you're interested, and that'll only be available um, during this session while we're live. Um, of course, you could get it afterwards, but this is kind of the easiest way to, to get it while we're here. You might want to take an opportunity to have a look there. Um, so with that, we're going to say thank you, and we're going to sign off. So thanks to everybody for joining us.